Scripture passage today is found in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. The twelfth chapter, verses two through ten, and I am reading it in the New Revised Standard Version. Usually I read an easier version, but this one uses language that may be familiar to many. Paul is writing to the church in the city of Corinth, and he says to them, I know a person who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard of me. Even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. When I was only five years old, I sang a solo in a talent contest. I sang a song called The Little White Duck a little white duck, and I took myself very seriously, five years old. Many young children, probably most young children, take themselves seriously. And you know what? All of those adults laughed when I sang. They laughed. It just broke my heart. How dare they make fun of the little white duck? I was going to be an opera singer someday. Anyway, (laughs) I didn't know as a little child, and children often don't know, that when the grown-ups laugh, it is a sign that they are with you. They're on your side. And I didn't know that they were on my side. I guess they thought I was really cute. And um, the fact that I was so serious made it even cuter somehow. But as a child, I always thought of that as a blot on my career. You know, a sad day. (laughs) I felt that I had not received the respect that was due to my solo about the little white duck. (laughs) 
In recent years, when I have gone back to my family home church in Minnesota, the church my father and his father and his grandfather before him were members of, and the church where I was baptized, when I go back to that church, I often get invited to preach there. And they are very kind, and they are very supportive. But maybe it's because I've been away so long and so much. I may seem more like a visiting philosopher than a hometown person. And maybe I was always something of a stranger in that church in the United States because I was in Thailand for most of my childhood. And I was in the United States only for short stretches of time here and there. Some of you who know the Bible may remember the story of Jesus when he first began to teach in his own hometown of Nazareth. Do you remember how little respect Jesus got among the people who already knew him? And for the Apostle Paul, it was even worse because he had faults and he had flaws. And he was, in fact, a man who struggled with being very self-important, very conceited. What they used to say in the southern part of the United States, he had the big head. He thought highly of himself. But if you know the story of the Apostle Paul, he participated in murder. He was part of killing the very first Christian who died for the name of Jesus Christ, Stephen, the first martyr. In the story, if you read the book of Acts, there was a young man standing to the side holding everybody's coat while they killed this man for believing in Jesus. And that man who held everybody's coats was the man who later became Paul the Apostle. And you know, he was changed. Jesus met him on the road, and he was changed. And he started traveling, and he started teaching. I wonder if everybody believed that he had really changed. He had been a great danger to Christians. But do you know, he took a new name when he became a believer in Jesus Christ. His name was Saul. After the first king of Israel, he took the name Paul. And we may or may not know it, but Paul means short man. So I guess his Christian name was Shorty. And uh, I think in every culture, short people have trouble getting respect. And so it was a way for him to be reminded that he was not important because he was Paul, but because of what Jesus Christ could do in his life. But as I said, he had flaws and he had faults. And there is a story in the book of Acts in the 20th chapter that says, Paul was preaching one day, and he went on and on and on. And one young man fell asleep listening, <clears throat> but the young man was sitting up high in a window, and he fell down and died because Paul preached too long. It's a story in the Bible. It's there in the book of Acts. Now, thanks be to God, he was raised back to life, that young man, that day. But here is what one preacher of today says about Paul the Apostle. The Roman authorities and the Jewish officials each took turns arresting Paul. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was stoned. People threw stones at him, tried to kill him. 
Imagine what he must have looked like. He must have had scars all over on his face, on his body. And this same preacher says, what if you were on, what do they call it at Watanad Church, the search committee for a new pastor? The, what do they call it? The pulpit committee? The Okay, so, aha, ha sit yapi ban mai. Okay, the committee that's looking for a new preacher. And what if Paul came to that committee, this little short man, you know, he was, he had bruises, he was injured, he had a record of being in jail. He had a history of division, he didn't even have a wife, he preached too long. And not only that, he wasn't considered a good speaker. Who would want that man to teach their Christian community? Why would God have given that man so much authority and so much responsibility and at the same time so many limitations? So many faults, so many shortcomings. And yet here in this passage that we've just read, in his second letter to the Corinthians, he's boasting about himself. Now part of the problem for Paul in those days was that he was caught between cultures and this is something that almost everyone here, probably everyone, understands in some way or other. More than one culture around us, how do we deal with the differences? He was caught between the Jewish culture and the culture of the Greeks and the Romans. The Jews were very strongly against boasting or bragging. They were very opposed to it. This was not what a person should do. But the Greeks and the Romans expected people to brag and boast about themselves. It was expected in their culture, and especially for someone who had as much education as the Apostle Paul had. So here he was, what do I do? I'm a Jew, but I'm also a Roman citizen, and he was dealing with the church in Corinth. They were not Jewish Christians. They were Gentile Christians, the people of the nations. And he had visited them earlier to try to help them solve a problem in their church. And apparently when he had come to them, he had been gentle with them. Perhaps he had been too gentle. And then some other preachers came to the big city of Corinth, and they called the name of Jesus, but they put on quite a show. They were very flashy. They talked about amazing spiritual experiences, and they asked for money every chance they got. They especially went to the rich members of the church, or at least the richer members, and asked for money all the time and bragged and boasted about their experiences of the Spirit of God. And they also said, who is this Paul that you claim as your teacher? He hasn't done anything wonderful like we have. Who is he? And so Paul realized that he was going to have to boast to the people in Corinth, to hear what his credentials were. Because some people would rather have a magician, a showman, a performer, instead of a pastor. And this may have been the problem in that community. So Paul told them, that he also had had deep spiritual experiences and visions. 
And the fact that he starts out saying, I know someone, I'm not going to tell you who it was who went up to the third heaven. All the biblical scholars will tell you he was talking about himself. He just was trying not to boast too much. But then Paul does something very, very different from any teacher. He talks about his humiliation. He talks about his own weakness. This was not done. And yet he boasted about it. He talked about what he called the thorn in the flesh. And this is a saying that people in the Western world will know. They will have heard this, the thorn in the flesh. Some people say, my neighbor is a thorn in my flesh. They drive me crazy, you know. Um, I don't know if people are the thorn in the flesh. That's not what Paul seems to be talking about. But those who have studied scripture for many, many centuries have always wondered, what was it? What was the thing that caused him to suffer? The thing that he asked God to take away and heal, and God said no. God said no. What was this thorn in his flesh? It could have been all the beatings and persecutions he'd already been through. I forgot to mention, you know, he was in shipwrecks, and one time he was bitten by a snake. Everything he went through. <laughs> Could that have been it? I mean, he must have been covered with scars. He probably had broken bones. I don't know if they set bones well in those days. Some people, some people who study the Bible say, well, maybe it was an illness. Maybe he had epilepsy. Maybe he had what they used to call fits. Maybe he had bad eyesight. We know that he had a secretary to write his letters, and there was even one of his letters where he said, see what big letters I use to sign my name? So maybe he had arthritis. Some people think he may have had malaria. If you know about malaria, it comes back again and again. Maybe it was his personality that troubled him so much. <laughs> Who knows? But think about that when you start to be irritated with your Christian brothers and sisters. The earliest followers of Jesus, the greatest teachers, sometimes rubbed other people the wrong way. Sometimes they were prickly. Sometimes they did not have the smoothest personality. Paul boasted about his weakness. And he said, he said more than that, he said, it was the one thing that allowed God to work powerfully in his life. Because he had flaws, because he had shortcomings, he had to rely on the grace of God of God. He could never pretend to be perfect. Even if he was a Roman citizen, even if he had more education than almost anybody they ever heard of in those days. Now I wonder if some of you know the story of when Jesus sent his own disciples out to preach and to heal. And the thing that Jesus told them was, do not be prepared. Do not prepare yourself ahead of time. It's very strange. Jesus told them, don't take any supplies. Don't even take an extra pair of shoes or anything extra to wear. Just go and tell people that God has come near. Jesus wasn't just telling them to 
live by faith. He was telling them to live by reckless faith. What, would we ever give this advice to anybody? You know, don't, don't plan before you go. <laughs> I'll tell you what, they never tell that to missionaries. <laughs> they didn't tell it to me, for sure. So, in the face of disrespect, and this happened to the greatest teachers of the early church, in the face of great disrespect, we learn two things. One is to be thankful for weakness. And the other is to go out in reckless faith, faith that doesn't even know what's going to happen next. I shared with this congregation last week that the Christian leaders who have touched my life the most and the most strongly were people who had great gifts from God, but they also suffered. And sometimes they suffered because of other Christians. I'm talking about people I have known who have affected my life the most strongly as examples of Christian life. They never pretended to be perfect, and they did not hide their weaknesses. And yet I found that was what helped me the most to grow as a Christian, to know leaders like that who did not hide that they were not perfect. They also had faults. And yet, it is very painful to think that whatever it was that Paul suffered with, in addition to everything else we heard on the list of being beaten and arrested and jailed and whipped, and he prayed three times that God would take this away. And he did not get the answer that he wanted for that prayer. At least not the way he was hoping, not the way he had been expecting the answer. But that happens to us too. Sometimes we pray very earnestly for something and the answer does not come the way we wanted. I will share with you a story of my own life this is a little bit different, but it, it has some relation, I think, to the story we're discussing. When my mother was dying, this was many years ago now, she was in pain, and it was pain that the doctors could not help her with. She had been in severe pain for the last final two years of her life because she was allergic to all the pain medicines that might have helped her. And I prayed more than three times that she would not have that pain. And not only that, I prayed for her to be healed. I wanted her to live another 25 years more than she had because her mother before her had lived to be 102. And I thought that my mother should live that long as well. That prayer was not answered in the way I had wanted. But if I were to think a little more deeply, what did I want for my mother more than anything else? More than anything else in the whole universe? It was not freedom from pain. It was to be one with God. That's what I wanted for my mother more than anything else, that she would be one with God, that she would be in union with God. What I wanted for her was faith. What I wanted for her was strength, even while she was weak. What I wanted for her was freedom from fear and respect. 
Those prayers were answered, even though she died when I wasn't ready, but I guess we're never ready. And do you know this is what happened for the Apostle Paul? He also had union with God, and he had faith, reckless faith, strength in weakness. Finally, in the end, he was free of fear. And for 2,000 years, he has been one of the most respected characters in history. Those were the answers to prayer for Paul. Think about it. What would be the answers for you?